Okay, I guess it's time to start. Hi, everyone, and uh, welcome to this uh, slide science event uh, dedicated to uh, machine learning. Uh, I remind you that the, the main objective of this uh, of this week is to allow uh, the attendees, uh, non-expert in, uh, in machine learning, to uh, including uh, master students, uh, PhD students, uh, uh, postdocs, even uh, uh, permanent researchers, to uh, uh, benefit for their own research uh, from some of the recent advances in, in machine learning. Um, so uh, during this week, you will have the opportunity to attend uh, about, uh, as uh, uh, Pierre said, uh, 20 hours of lectures. And um, so after a general introduction to machine learning uh, this morning, uh, Charlotte Laclau uh, this, uh, this afternoon will uh, uh, explain um, uh, how to anticipate common problems uh, we can face uh, when we deal with uh, uh, real world data and uh, how to get your data ready for, for learning, before learning. Uh, tomorrow morning, uh, Rémi et Monet will uh, talk about uh, imbalance learning and anomaly detection. Uh, that is when your, your training data at your disposal uh, contain um, a large number of so-called negative examples and only a, a few positive ones. And by positive, I mean the, the examples of interest, like uh, the anomalies you are looking for, which are uh, often uh, very sparse in a, a scarce, sorry, in the in the data set. Uh, then Yevgen Redko will uh, talk about uh, one of the most uh, uh, one of the most hot topic, let's say, in, in machine learning studied nowadays in the machine learning community, uh, that is uh, domain adaptation and transfer learning. Uh, basically, the, the idea is to uh, benefit from uh, a source task and to adapt the learned model to address a so-called target task, uh, which is different but related to the source one. And uh, uh, an example is, for example, your, your source task can be the recognition of, uh, let's say, cats from images or from uh, videos. And the objective in domain adaptation is to automat automatically adapt uh, the learned model to address, for example, the, a task like the recognition of dogs uh, from images without retraining from scratch a new model. This is basically the idea of transfer learning. Uh, then I will present a tutorial on optimal transport, uh, which is a very old theory, uh, which provides um, a natural geometry for comparing probability measures. And I will uh, show you that uh, uh, the optimal transport has, has received a, a tremendous interest in, uh, in the machine learning community during the past, uh, the past decade. Um, we will have the, uh, the pleasure to welcome uh, uh, Christian Wolf, uh, Thursday. Uh, it turns out that Christ, uh, Christian Wolf from the Leris Lab and Christian is uh, an expert in deep learning. And you will have the opportunity to attend uh, two lectures on deep learning on these very hot topics. Topic. Uh, in the first part, Christian will present the main models and algorithms for deep learning. And in the second part, from a more practical perspective, uh, he will introduce, he will present uh, PyTorch, which is uh, one of the most used uh, deep learning framework and Autograd. And you will have the possibility, if you have your own laptop during the second part of the course, to practice a bit and to play with this platform on a toy uh, example during the lecture. Uh, as Pierre said, we have the this year, we have a joint day uh, between the uh, Slight uh, uh, Graduate School, Manunex Slight Graduate School, and uh, the two doctoral schools, uh, Mega and Materio. And during this joint day, uh, which uh, will be held on, on Wednesday, uh, Anthony Gravouille from the LAMCOS Lab and uh, Francisco Cinesta from the NSAM will talk about the general uh, topic uh, uh, artificial intelligence and, and materials. Okay, so uh, let's start. This is uh, the outline of this uh, first uh, lecture of the week. Um, my main objective uh, is to give you the big picture of what is machine learning and what are the main concepts used in, uh, in statistical uh, machine learning. After general introduction, I will uh, present the two main learning settings, uh, that is the unsupervised and the supervised settings. 
And then uh, I will only focus on the latter. That's why I will introduce some notations uh, of the, about the supervised learning uh, framework. I will uh, talk about uh, the notion of true risk and empirical risk, and I will uh, basically explain that behind any machine learning problem, there is always, almost always, a mathematical optimization problem which aims at minimizing a so-called loss function. And I will present the most uh, used loss functions in, in, in machine learning. I will also talk about the notion of overfitting, the notion of bias variance. I will just say a few words about the uh, theoretical guarantees we can derive in machine learning. And then I will talk about the key points uh, uh, in machine learning, which is uh, uh, the, the notion of regularization. And uh, uh, at the end of my presentation, I will give you some a good practice on how to split your data set into three parts for learning, for tuning the hyperparameters of your model, and for evaluating the model you have learned, uh, and the behavior at test time of this model on new unknown data. Ask your first question. Uh, do you consider that the three notions, artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, and deep learning are uh, synonym? Uh, if you are a bit confused about the, the difference between those three concepts, uh, let's uh, uh, look at the, the following slide. Okay, artificial intelligence uh, is about the consider programs uh, that have the, the capacity to uh, execute tasks that are usually uh, done by, a, by human being. And there are plenty of tasks that can fall into this scope. And uh, uh, for example, the natural language processing, uh, the voice recognition, or like in this, in this video, uh, uh, the motion, right? So this video from Boston Dynamics shows a, a robot. And what is important to note, if you look at this video, is that this uh, uh, robot has uh, sensors uh, in its legs, uh, uh, sensors in, uh, in its body to, to balance. It uh, also have, uh, has uh, sensors uh, in its uh, head, and also uh, uh, it uses a, a, a LiDAR system to avoid uh, obstacles, uh, to uh, uh, assess the terrain, to uh, uh, manipulate objects like in this, uh, in this, in this video. What is important to note is that in its first in, in its first versions, uh, this robot uh, didn't make use of machine learning. Uh, it uh, it uh, didn't learn from uh, from experience. Um, what it do, everything it does, uh, roughly speaking, its behavior has been uh, pre-programmed, let's say, in the form of uh, lines of code, in the form of decision rules. Uh, preventing uh, the robot from uh, falling on the ground or hitting an obstacle. So he didn't learn from experience. And this is the main difference with machine learning, which definitely learns from experience, from observed data, from training data. So you have an example there, so, and without being explicitly programmed. You have an example on this, uh, on this slide, uh, let's take a very simple example. The objective is to uh, discriminate between uh, images of cats and dogs, right? So what we do uh, usually in machine learning, we collect a set of data called a, a set of training examples, a set of cats and a set of images with dogs. And uh, we will come back to this later, but we will encode those complex images in the form of points in, an, in some a numerical feature space. So we get now, uh, we get now um, uh, a, a cloud of points. And then what we do in machine learning, we learn from those, from this experience, the objective is to learn the parameters of uh, uh, a so-called classifier. So the classifier here is just the uh, corresponds to the green line. And the objective is to learn the parameters of this green line, which discriminates the best, the two categories of points. And once it's learned, it corresponds to like a decision rule. We can use this model afterwards to recognize a new guy and to, 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 to say if this, uh, this uh, new image is a dog or, or a cat. So uh, 
So to sum up, um, you can uh, definitely do uh, uh, artificial intelligence uh, without doing machine learning. And machine learning is a subfield of artificial intelligence requiring to learn from observed data. And regarding deep learning, deep learning is nothing more than um, uh, a, sub, a subcategory of machine learning uh, uh, algorithms, right? It's one of the uh, numerous techniques for learning with the specific goal of uh, optimizing the parameters of a so-called artificial neural networks. And you have an example on the left of such a deep learning. Uh, obviously, we will come back to this uh, later deeply uh, uh, during, during this week. Right. Um, it turns out that machine learning is, um, is an interdisciplinary uh, scientific uh, domain uh, at the interface of uh, several uh, fields. First, so if you want to do machine learning, you need skills from three different subfields. Uh, the first one is math and optimization, because as I'm going to show you during this lecture, uh, behind any machine learning problem, there is almost always a mathematical optimization problem and sometimes under constraints. So we need to be good at optimization to solve such uh, problems. We also need skills in statistics. Uh, because, as you will see, we manipulate a lot of notions like uh, expected values, uh, variances, uh, uh, samples drawn from uh, identically and identically dist uh, and independently distributed uh, from an unknown distribution. We will also use, uh, if we want to derive uh, guarantees in machine learning, we need to use uh, uh, um, uh, concentration inequalities. So all those uh, uh, notions comes from statistics, and we need. Uh, to have some skills uh, from this domain. And the last, obviously, the, the last field is computer science because we need skills uh, to, uh, uh, in this domain to, uh, uh, to design, to implement, and to test uh, the algorithms we will, we will develop. Okay. So um, I guess that you know that machine learning has had uh, some success stories during the past uh, years. Uh, one example is described on this on this slide. I guess that some of you, uh, most of you, already know this example, AlphaGo, uh, which is uh, uh, which has been developed by Deep, DeepMind. Uh, it's a computer program that plays uh, the board game Go, and uh, a key date. It, it makes use of uh, uh, deep learning of uh, neural networks, and uh, a key date is uh, 2017 when AlphaGo uh, defeated. Uh, the world number one uh, uh, key gene. So this is uh, one of the main uh, success stories of machine learning uh, uh, during the past uh, years. Um, it turns out that machine learning also received a tremendous interest uh, uh, from the computer vision uh, community. And you have on this slide some examples, for example, for detecting objects uh, from, from, uh, from videos, um, uh, in, uh, it's used a lot in, in the new self-driving car systems or also for generating um, artificial uh, images. So here you have an example of the so-called GAN, the Generative Adversarial Networks, which aim at generating fake images uh, like on this slide. So if you are interested in the, the computer vision uh, applications of machine learning, please come to session D2 and D3 on uh, Thursday, uh, and please come to listen to uh, Christian Wolf, we will, uh, who will talk a lot about those, those topics. Uh, I don't know if you're a big fan of uh, television series, but it turns out that uh, artificial intelligence in general and, and machine learning have inspired uh, some of them. And just to cite a few, Westworld, Person of Interest, Humans, a minority report, which is a bit older, and and uh, an almost human, ju just to cite a few. Um, okay, and to finish this introduction, I would like also to to say that during the past uh, few years, uh, we observed that a lot of international conferences and workshops have been organized and sharing two scientific domains, uh, uh, two scientific fields physics in general and, and machine learning. So you have plenty of conferences with the title machine learning and physics, machine learning and photonics, machine learning and optics and so on. And just to illustrate uh, the trend of this phenomenon, 
Uh, on this slide, you have the number of uh, occurrences of the three words, keywords, machine learning, optics, and photonics in the titles of uh, papers published uh, during the past uh, 20 years. And what you can see is that you, we have an almost uh, exponential uh, growth of this uh, uh, of the number of, of artic joint articles, I would say, at the interface of the two domains, which, uh, which uh, means that this uh, machine learning and physics in general is very, very uh, trendy, let's say. Okay, so um, first of all, I, I'm, uh, I would like to introduce the two main uh, learning settings in machine learning. So they are, it's not an exhaustive, exhaustive list. I'm, I'm going to present just the, 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 the two most used uh, uh, frameworks. So the first one is called the unsupervised learning. So what is the goal of unsupervised learning? We assume that we have examples, training examples, described by a uh, feature vector X, right? And uh, uh, for example, if you take a patient, uh, this patient can be represented in the form of a feature vector with, uh, for example, the age, the gender, the temperature, the blood pressure, or whatever. So we have now what, one, ex one patient can be represented at, as, as a point in a numerical uh, a feature space. And uh, in unsupervised learning, we do not assume that we have information about the label of this example. We, do, we, we don't assume that we have the label Y, which means in this example that we don't know, for example, if the patient is, uh, is uh, uh, sick or not, for example, right? So the goal in, of this unsupervised learning setting is to uh, find the underlying structure of the, um, uh, of the, of the data. So um, there are several uh, uh, frameworks. Uh, the one of the most popular is clustering. So in clustering, basically the idea, I guess that um, many of you already uh, uh, run a clustering algorithm. So basically the idea is to uh, build clusters of uh, uh, examples that are uh, similar uh, according to some uh, uh, similarity or dissimilarity measure. And one of the most popular clustering algorithm is, is k-means. So behind a clustering algorithm, there is a, an algorithm, uh, uh, an optimization problem, and you have here uh, uh, the formulation of, the, of, a, of a clustering approach, which basically in this case aims at uh, minimizing the, the within variance of the, of, the, of the clusters. It's a complicated optimization problem, and that's why most of the time we need to use so-called greedy algorithm to solve this problem. A second example of unsupervised learning is, once again, something uh, uh, that you, you probably uh, uh, already know. It's a PCA, Principal Component Analysis. So here, the objective is uh, to uh, reduce the dimensionality of your data. Most of the time, and this is the case here with my patients, uh, it, every single example is described here by four features, so you cannot visualize your data. And the objective of PCA is to reduce this dimensionality, to project the data in a smaller space, and hopefully in a 2D space or 3D space to visualize your data, right? And to do this, we are going to benefit from the correlations uh, between the features to reduce the number of, uh, of dimensions, dimensions uh, without losing too much information. And behind a PCA problem, uh, we have once again an optimization problem, which uh, boils down to, uh, roughly speaking, maximizing uh, the variance in the, in the projected space. A third example of uh, unsupervised learning is matrix factorization. And you have on this slide an example in recommender system. Uh, recommender system, so we have a matrix where the rows are the users and the columns are the movies. And the objective is, and the intersection of a row and the column is nothing more than the rate uh, the user uh, gave to a, to a movie uh, he, she uh, watched. And uh, it turns out that this matrix is pretty sparse. There are a lot of zeros in this, uh, or empty entries uh, in this uh, matrix. And the objective of metric factorization is to complete this matrix automatically by using linear algebra operations. And basically the idea is to uh, rebuild, reconstruct the matrix in the form of the, 
product of two new matrices which have to be uh, uh, to be learned and uh, and the uh, optimization behind uh, this pro this problem is the minimization of the error of reconstruction of the original uh, matrix okay the second uh, 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 learning setting is the supervised uh, one the main difference between the two is that uh, I remind you that in unsupervised, we don't have access to Y. And in the supervised learning, we consider, we assume that both X, the feature representation of the examples, and Y, uh, the label of the examples, are known, right? That's why it's called supervised, because we have supervision in the form of labels, uh, the labels uh, Y. So there are two uh, uh, subfields in unsupervised learning. When y is a, this, a, a continuous value, uh, we are talking about regression, and I guess that most of you already know uh, regression, of, of, uh, obviously. So an example is x is, for example, the day, and y is the temperature. Temperature. So the objective is to, given x, given the day, we want to predict the continuous value, which corresponds to the temperature. This is regression. And the second, uh, uh, the second field, is uh, called classification. In this case, the main difference comes from the nature of A or Y. In this case, Y is a discrete value. For example, if you want to predict the, the gender of a person according to two features, uh, the weight and the height of the, of, the, of the person. In this case, Y is discrete, and that's why we call this task a classification problem. Okay? But both share the same objective, given X, uh, we want to predict the value of y. So you have two illustrations uh, on this on this slide. So first, an example of regression, right? We have on the x-axis the day, and we want to predict the temperature. We collect a training set. We collect a bunch of examples that corresponds to the blue examples. And what we want to do is to learn the parameters of, uh, in this case, a simple model, a line, which fits the best the points, right? And behind this problem, we have... Uh, uh, an optimization problem which minimizes, uh, most of the time, the objective is to minimize the Euclidean distance between the learned model, the green line, and uh, the coordinate of the training examples. In classification, an example here. Uh, so the, 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 the training examples are, are described by two features, the weight and the height of the person. The color gives you uh, the label, red for male and blue for female, and the objective is to learn a classifier uh, which uh, discriminates the best uh, the two categories. In this case, since we are learning something very simple in the form of a line, this model makes error uh, uh, over the training examples. And I will show you during this course that sometimes it's not a big deal to make some errors at training time for preventing the algorithm from overfitting. This is a notion I will, uh, I will come to, to this later. And behind this problem, we have an optimization problem, which basically aims at minimizing the number of disagreements between uh, the predicted value by my classifier, which is h of x, and the expected label, which is y, and which is known because I remind you that we are in a supervised learning setting, so we know in advance the value of y uh, for our training examples. Okay, so during this, the rest of this uh, lecture, I will only focus on the supervised learning, so assuming that I know both X and Y. And the, the last uh, message I want to, to tell you uh, on this slide is that, as you can see, uh, whatever the, the machine learning problem we, we deal with, unsupervised or supervised, Behind these problems, there is always an optimization, uh, a mathematical optimization problem. And I will come back to this later. Okay. Um, even though I won't uh, uh, focus on a specific machine learning algorithm during this lecture, the objective is just to give you the main concept of statistical machine learning. On this slide, I just show you some popular supervised learning algorithms. Uh, Obviously, you have deep learning. Deep learning, as you probably know, uh, aims at learning the parameters of a neural network. Okay, so you have an illustration on the right. And what we learn is just the weight uh, assigned to each edge between two neurons. 
And if you are building a deep, deep neural network, uh, sometimes you have millions of parameters to learn. That's why most of the time we need a, a, a lot of examples to train a, a deep neural network. But uh, Christian Wolf will uh, come back to this uh, uh, on, on Thursday during during his lectures. I don't know if you are familiar with support vector machines, which is which is one of the most popular uh, uh, learning algorithm. Basically, the idea of SVMs is to learn a hyperplane, a linear separator, which linearly separates your data. And unfortunately, most of the time, your data in their original space. Uh, cannot be linearly separated. So, so basically, the idea of SVMs is to use the so-called kernel trick, and we project the data in a higher space where the data now are linearly separable. And we learn in this space the uh, coefficient of this uh, hyperplane, and then it, once it's learned, we can come back to the original one and get something, by the way, which is not linear anymore. Another machine learning algorithm is called decision tree. So the objective here is to split the feature space step by step according to the most discriminative features. And we get a model which is, by the way, uh, interpretable, which can be very useful, for example, in applications, in medical applications, for example, when, when you make a decision, you have to understand uh, why you are making this de decision. And, and that's why we don't, we don't uh, want uh, in, in, in medical application black boxes where even though the model is very efficient, if you cannot explain why you made this decision, you, you, you prefer to use such a decision tree models. Um, another machine learning algorithm, which is well known, is the K nearest neighbor algorithm. Oh, by the way, it's not really a machine learning algorithm because we don't learn anything. That's why this algorithm is usually called a lazy one. Uh, because uh, a k nearest neighbor algorithm just um, save your data, and when you have to predict the label of a new guy, you, you just look at the close neighborhood of this example, and you apply your majority vote among the labels of the neighborhood. So it doesn't learn anything, but it's a very efficient algorithm based on the on the on the saying, let's say, a bird of a feather flock together. And the last example, once again, it's not exhaustive, but the last example in regression, okay. Uh, or in a super vector regression. Here, uh, the output, once again, is continuous, unlike uh, the, the previous method. We want to predict a, a continuous va value like the temperature of the day. And in this case, what we want to learn is the coefficient of a polynomial. You have an example there. Uh, it can be a line, but most of the time we are going to learn something a bit more complicated. And we want to learn uh, the parameters of a line, which uh, of a polynomial, which fits the best uh, the, the data. Right. Um, a take home message I would like to give you is uh, data is key in machine learning. Okay. Uh, Charlotte will come back to this this afternoon on the, on the importance of having a, a lot of data, uh, clean data, uh, complete data. Uh, but most of the time, when you are dealing with a real world application, you collect data and sometimes they are pretty simple, like uh, you already have feature vectors. So it's something like a point in a space and we like it a lot in machine learning. But uh, most of the time, we don't have such simple data and we have uh, 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 complex data, structural data. And you have some examples on this slide. Your data can, for example, represent a patient, right? But you can also represent... Uh, uh, a signal, something more complex, a spectrum of something. You can also have data in the form of uh, graphs, big graphs, like a, a big social network, how to deal with such complex data. You can have data in the form of uh, images or videos or even in the form of text, right? And it turns out that uh, in machine learning, what, what, we, like to, what, what we like is uh, a training set composed of points, right? We like data represented by uh, feature vectors in some numerical uh, feature space, hopefully uh, relevant and discriminative features uh, according to the task at hand. And then what we get is, uh, is a set of points in uh, some D uh, numerical feature space. And we like to, we like to have this, uh, this representation because uh, now we can uh, 
benefit from uh, uh, the Euclidean property of the space. We can use distances to learn the parameters of the, the classifiers. Okay, so basically, this is what we, we, we want to harm in machine learning. But unfortunately, when you are dealing with a, a, an application, we don't have directly, uh, most of the time, uh, examples in a numerical feature space. So, when, for example, you have a patient, it's pretty simple to represent numerically uh, a, such an example because you have the expertise uh, in, in, in medicine. And, for example, uh, doctors will tell you that, oh, the age, the gender, the blood pressure, the temperature for this uh, task are, uh, are very relevant and discriminative. So, you, you have directly a point in a d-dimensional feature space. It's pretty simple. But what about the, the other uh, the other situations where you have very complex data? So basically, there are uh, two main um, categories of features, right? Uh, the observable features and the latent features. By observable, I mean features that can be directly uh, measurable from the data. And this is typically uh, the example of a patient, right? We know that we need to to get the age, the gender, the blood pressure, to have a good representation of the patient. So this is, this is pretty simple. About the latent features, we have two subcategories, the so-called handcrafted features and the learned features. So what about the handcrafted features? Uh, and I'm going to take uh, the example of a big graph, okay? Uh, when you want to represent uh, a graph in the form of numerical features, we need, we need expertise from the domain. And we know now uh, for decades that to describe the graph, uh, the degree of the graph, the, the eigenvector centrality of the graph, the, the Laplacian matrix are very relevant uh, uh, descriptors, variables to encode a graph into a numerical representation. It turns out that most of the time those features are not uh, easily or directly measurable li like the temperature of a patient because, for example, if you want uh, to get the eigenvectors of, uh, of a graph, you need to perform a, 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 single, a singular value decomposition, which can be costly, right? So this is the main difference with the observable ones. And uh, they are called handcrafted features because this information comes from uh, the expertise of human being, of experts. And this is the main difference with the learned features. And you have an example here. Uh, Christian Wolf will come back to this uh, uh, later during his lectures. You have an example of a CNN, of a convolutional neural network. In this case, we don't need the expertise of, uh, of, um, of the domain, right? We just feed the data. In this case, we want to recognize if uh, there is a car in an image. We just feed the images, the training examples, directly in their uh, uh, original form to the deep neural network. And the deep neural network will learn a numerical representation of the data, which are very discriminative for the application at hand. And in this case, we want, I don't know if you can see on the slide, we want to discriminate different categories of objects uh, in images. So in this case, deep learning uh, directly learn uh, the representation of the data, which is well uh, suited to the application at hand. Though representation learning ha has many advantages, it's very computationally convenient because once the, the deep neural network is learned, which can take a lot of time, you can very quickly get a new representation of the data in the form of numerical features, right? It uh, allows to overcome the limitation of the handcrafted features because we don't need, uh, uh, we don't uh, require uh, expertise from human beings. And also, as I said, you learn uh, one representation which is specifically devoted to address the, uh, the uh, underlying problem. So if you are interested in uh, how to prepare your data, how to overcome the problem of messy data and complete data, please come to uh, the session uh, A3 of Charlotte Laclau this afternoon. And if you want to go deeper in the, in the representation learning and specifically in the context of uh, deep learning, uh, come to uh, listen to, to uh, Christian Wolf on Thursday. Okay. So now I will only focus on supervised learning and, and uh, mainly on, on the classification task. So I'm going to introduce the main notations of supervised learning. So as I said before, uh, in machine learning, we assume that we have a, a training set of examples called S, uh, 
which is composed of uh, m training examples. And for each examples, each example, we have two information, the feature representation, the, the variables describing the data, which is x, right? And the corresponding level y, right? And we assume that this training set has been uh, drawn IID independently and identically from an unknown distribution DZ, right? So we assume that those training examples have been uh, uh, drawn from a distribution DZ. For example, this, uh, okay, this is the training set, right? And we assume that this training set has been uh, selected randomly from a non-underlying distribution DZ. So as you can see, we have one distribution for uh, the blue examples and one distribution for the red one. And if we, you have access to, it, to the analytical expression of these uh, two distributions, we can generate examples. It turns out that we don't know DZ. We don't know the analytical form of these two distributions. What we have access to is just representatives of these two distributions in the form of S, the uh, training set, right? So keep in mind that we have training examples that come from a distribution which is, which is unknown. And um, we have two uh, spaces in a machine learning problem. We have the feature space, okay, which, describe, which describes the features of the data. On these toy examples, we are in a 2D space. So we are in the, in the PDM space in a, with two dimensions. And we have the, the output, out, output space, the label space. And for the sake of simplicity, I will assume uh, uh, from now that uh, I have two possible labels, blue, uh, for the so-called positive examples and red for the negative ones, okay? And now, what is a machine? Oh, and we also assume that in machine learning, there exists a function f, which take an example x and it assigns automatically the corresponding label. This uh, function is here, okay, in yellow. And this is the function which Actually, uh, we assume that this function is, uh, exists and which gives, uh, given x, gives uh, y. Unfortunately, f is unknown, right? And the goal of machine learning is to learn something which is as close to f as possible. So what is machine learning? We take a machine learning algorithm L. For example, on this toy example, I assume that I'm going to learn the best line and this line belongs to a set of lines. So said differently, when I take a machine learning algorithm, this machine learning algorithm is dedicated to learn some, some uh, classifiers, some shapes of classifiers, in this case, lines. And the goal of uh, learning is to select the best one among all the possible lines. So it's like we have a box with a large number of possible classifiers. In this case, by the way, the number of lines is infinite. And the goal of learning is to pick the best one uh, among uh, the possible classifiers of the box, right? And we want this line to be as close to F as possible, which is complicated because as you know, now F is unknown, but I will, I will show you that this, this is possible under some, some constraints, uh, especially about the number of examples we have access to. Okay, so to sum up, we want to learn a classifier, also called a model or a hypothesis, okay, which comes from a, a box of possible candidates, let's say, roughly speaking, as close to F, the target function we are looking for, as possible. Okay, so here, for example, you have, you have the, the, the best line we can learn from this uh, training uh, data. And at test time, once uh, you, when you deploy this model at test time, you want this green line to be very efficient on new examples generated from the DZ distribution, okay? So we hope that this green line uh, it will be uh, 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 very efficient, and we hope that H will be uh, close to, to F. Okay, and as I said during the introduction, um, this classifier, this hypothesis H, 
uh, will be obtained by minimizing something, minimizing a so-called loss function. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about the notion of risk and uh, 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 the notion of loss uh, function. Um, you remember we have, a, we have a box with plenty of candidates and what we want to do when we learn is to select the best one, the one which makes, for example, the smallest number of errors over my, my data. Right? So, in theory, we want to best to select the best one. Let's call this hypothesis the best one in my box H star. And uh, to select the best one, we need to measure the quality of this hypothesis. And to measure this quality, we need a loss function, which is a pretty simple function, which takes a candidate, a line, a, 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 a hypothesis, which, take an which takes an example and returns a, a number. And this number measures in some way the, 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 the degree of, uh, of agreement or disagreement between the prediction of the model. So this is my predictor, okay? This is my, oops. Uh, this is my uh, classifier. I take X and I predict the label of X. And why, which is known because I remind you that we are, we are in a supervised setting. So the loss just measures in some way the, the degree of disagreement between the predictions and what is expected. It's called a loss function. And now, based on the definition of this loss, we can define the notion of true risk, which is, roughly speaking, the behavior of my classifier at test time, when I will deploy my model on, on new examples, which are unknown, right? We didn't learn from uh, at training time. This true risk is very simple, is nothing more than the, sorry, than the expected value of this loss over the entire uh, uh, distribution DZ. It's the mean, let's say, of the losses uh, suffered by H over the entire distribution DZ. Okay, so it's the integral over uh, all the possible uh, examples that can be drawn from DZ of the loss suffered by H. And if you want to find, to pick the optimal classifier H star, you just have to minimize this true risk, right? You have an example on the right here. We have two distributions the distribution of the positive examples on the left, the distribution of the negative example on the right. And if you want to learn the optimal line, uh, uh, the, the, the H star will fall, will fall there, right? And this is the one which minimizes the number of errors, which correspond, by the way, to the purple region, okay? So this is the classifier which minimizes this, this area in, in purple. If you, if you understood what I said before, unfortunately, this quantity cannot be uh, uh, computed. It cannot be computed because for uh, calculating this quantity, we need to know uh, DZ, right? And DZ is unknown. I remind you that we don't know the expression, the analytical expression of these two distributions. We only, only have access to representatives of this uh, distribution, which are the training examples. So what we can do, we can take the empirical counterpart of this true risk, which is called the empirical, the empirical risk. Okay. And this empirical risk is nothing more than the empirical version of this, of this true risk. So rather than computing the expected value of over the entire distribution TZ, we compute the mean over the training examples. So we just count, the, we sum up the losses suffered by H over my training examples, right? So this classifier makes some errors, two red on the bad side and two blue on the bad side. So roughly speaking, the loss here suffered by H is four, four examples over the total number of examples, right? So basically, if you want to select a good classifier, what you have to do is to minimize this empirical risk. So 
it's uh, very natural, it seems very natural. What you want is to select the classifier, the line, which minimizes the number of errors made over the training examples. This is basically the idea of the empirical risk. Okay, so now I would like to say a few words about the loss we can use in machine learning, right? It turns out that the most natural one is called the zero one loss, which is the one I just, ex I just explained. This is the one which counts the number of errors of classification made by the classifier. Let's take an example uh, here. I assume that I have data in a 2D space, two labels blue and red, right? And I want to learn the best line. Let's suppose that I have learned this classifier, right? It turns out that when you use this line to predict an example, it suffices to compute the product H times Y. Because H is nothing more than the the equation of a, of a hyperplane, right? And when you plug, oh, by the way, what we are looking for is theta zero, theta one, and theta two, so the parameters of the model, which fits the best the data, right? And when you want to predict the level of a new example, what you do, you take the coordinate x1 and x2 of the example, and you compute the value of h. If this value is positive, it means that the prediction is positive, so, you assign the blue color to the example. If it's negative, you assign the red color, right? And it turns out that when you make an error, for example, this is the case for this guy, the product YH is negative. Look, this example is a positive example, so its label is plus one, right? But since it's below the hyperplane, the predictor label is negative. So you have something which is negative. So you get a result which is negative. So each time the result of y h is negative, you pay the price and you have a loss of one. So basically, what does this zero one loss function is just counting the number of errors. So this is exactly what we want to do. We want to learn something which is good, which minimizes the number of, of errors. So in this case, if you take the training examples, the empirical risk, uh, I remind you that I, I put a hat just to show that it's an empirical counterpart of the true risk. The error of this line is just one over the total number of training examples, which is which is 12, right? Um, so if you want to learn well, it seems that it suffices to minimize the empirical risk of the zero one loss. But the bad news is that this is too good to be true. Unfortunately, we cannot use in practice this loss function, which is, by the way, the most natural one. What is the reason of this claim is that if you you plot, if you if you build a, a the, the, rep, the, the, rep, the graphical illustration of this curve, we get this function in red, right? I guess you agree. Each time y h is negative, you pay the price of one, okay? You make an error, and each time the product is positive, it means that your classification is correct. So we have this, the shape of the zero one loss is, the, is the, this one, and unfortunately, this function is non-convex, which is the main pitfall of this loss function, and it's not uh, differentiable everywhere. And when it, when, it, when it is, actually, the derivative is zero. So it's a, it's a very messy function because in machine learning, what we'd like to, to have is something which is convex, right? Why? Because I guess that everybody in the audience is familiar with uh, convex functions. So this is an example of the x square function. So it's something very simple. Let's suppose uh, in the general case that it's a convex loss function, which depends on parameter theta. When you want to find the minimum of this function, you just have to compute the derivative of this function with respect to the parameter you are looking for, theta. You set the derivative to zero and, and, you, get, and you get the minimum. So 
we like a lot in machine learning convex function for this reason, because we are sure that if we minimize such a convex function, we have only one global minimum, right? And, and, it, all, and it always exists. So that's why we say such, uh, we call such problems the well-posed problem because the solution always exists and, and it's unique. The global minimum is the, is, is, um, it turns out that the zero one loss uh, do not fulfill this uh, requirement. That's why in machine learning, we don't use this function and we need uh, proxies. We need surrogate functions to address uh, uh, the, the application at hand. So I show you on this slide the most popular loss functions that are used in the machine learning algorithms. The first one is the exponential function, which is very simple. It's the exponential of minus the product yh, right? And you have a, a, a graphical representation in blue uh, of this exponential function. And as you can see, this function is convex. It's uh, differentiable everywhere. And roughly speaking, when you minimize this blue line, you, 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 you are mimicking in some way the minimization of the black one, which is the zero one loss. So it's an upper bound of the, of the black line. So if you minimize this function, you tend to minimize the zero one loss, the, the, much, the most natural one. This function has some advantages and, and, uh, and some disadvantages. Uh, the pros are, as I said, it's convex and differentiable unlike the zero one loss, the, the black line here. So it's very, it's very cool. Uh, the price to pay is that this function uh, never reaches zero. As you can see, even though you are very well, uh, well classified, okay? So the, the more you're on the right, uh, uh, the better you are, you are classified and you never reach zero, right? You, we have to accept it, but it's not the, a big deal. The, the most important problem is that because of the exponential nature of this function, uh, you can have a, a so-called uh, gradient explosion. If, for example, you have uh, an example which is very badly recognized, the price you will be uh, you will pay is something which is, which will exponentially grow, uh, uh, increase, and this can be a a, a big uh, a pitfall when you have outliers. So. I illustrate this notion of outliers, and I guess that Charlotte will come back to this notion uh, this afternoon. Uh, we have seven examples. We have six that are pretty simple. It seems that everything is almost perfect because a line will perfectly discriminate between the two. But unfortunately, we have this guy, which seems to be an outlier. If you use this exponential loss, what happens? You will have an explosion of the of the you plug the coordinate of this guy in the equation, you will have a, a big error, which is, which, which is very, very a, a massive number. And probably you won't get this classifier at the end of the day. Probably you will get something like this. Because uh, you prefer to correctly classify the red example, okay? Uh, even though you are, you are getting something totally stupid because you are definitely not able to discriminate with the, with, with, uh, the, the rest of the training set. So just a take home message, if you want to use the exponential function, I suggest to remove uh, the outliers during, during a preprocess. I guess that uh, Charlotte will, will come back to this uh, this afternoon. A second example is the, is the logistic loss. Okay, it's more or less the same, but we just plug the log of one plus the exponential function. And you have the, the illustration of this uh, function in green. And as you can see, this function is much smoother because of the log than the exponential one. It's still convex and differentiable. It's never equals to zero, equals zero, but you don't have the, the, the same uh, gradient explosion uh, 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 than, than, uh, as, as the exponential one. The last example is the Hinge loss, which is used in super vector machines. I don't enter into the details of this function, but you have an illustration of this function is in red. And this function is pretty cool because it's, it's convex, it's linear, piecewise linear. It can reach zero 
The main problem is it's not differentiable everywhere. I don't enter into details, but it has subgradients and it can be uh, most of the solvers, every solver and nowadays can, can deal with this uh, loss function. Just a few words about the loss functions that are used in deep learning. Most of the time we use the so-called uh, cross entropy, uh, which is also convex and differentiable. It's well dedicated when you uh, deal with uh, uh, probabilities. Uh, that is uh, often the case in deep learning when we play with the so-called uh, 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 softmax uh, values and you plug the softmax values in the cross entropy and you get something very, very simple. So uh, Christian Wolf will talk about this uh, loss function in deep learning uh, during the session D2 and D3. Okay, and uh, a last message on the loss functions. Uh, Note that these functions are not well suited to deal with imbalance scenario. Imbalance scenarios. I remind you that what is an imbalance scenario when you have plenty of red examples and only a few uh, blue ones. In this case, those functions are no, not well adapted. And uh, uh, Rémi and Monet uh, tomorrow morning will talk about uh, how to address such a problem, and he will explain that we need to optimize other specific uh, measures. Okay, uh, to finish this first part of this of this uh, lecture, I would like to show you an example. Uh, I would like to build with you a first machine learning algorithm. So let's suppose that I take the exponential function, okay, the exponential loss. I have a data set, a bunch of blue and red examples. And okay, you know that the exponential loss takes this form. It's the exponential of minus y, the label, plus one minus one and h, which is the, the prediction, the sign of the prediction of the, of, the, of the classifier. And what I'm going to do is to learn something very simple, just for the sake of simplicity. I'm going to learn a line. So a line described by this, this equation. So h of theta is just the equation of a line. So I plug this equation in the exponential function. Now, since the exponential function is convex, differentiable everywhere, I can compute the gradient, I can compute the derivative of this loss with respect to the three parameters I'm looking for, theta zero, theta one, and theta two. So let's call, in a general case, theta i, okay? And if you compute the derivative of this exponential function, it's, it's straightforward, we get this new expression, okay? And now, what we can do, I'm going to use a so-called gradient descent algorithm. So I don't know if you are all already familiar with this kind of method. For those who don't know this gradient descent me method, I illustrate the principle on the, on the right of the slide. So we have a function which is in blue, which is convex. We want to find the minimum. What we can do with the gradient descent algorithm, we can initialize randomly at time t the parameters, theta zero, theta one, and theta two. We evaluate the value of h at this point, and we compute the gradient. Said differently, we just build the tangent at this point, right? And we get, uh, okay, the slope is given by the uh, derivative, the gradient, right, at this point. And what is very interesting to note is that if you take this point, the gradient uh, is, uh, the slope is, is, uh, is going up, so, so the gradient is positive. And what the theory tells us, if you want to find the minimum, to go to the minimum, what you have to do is to go uh, uh, to the opposite direction of the gradient. Okay? This is exactly what is explained here. The new value of the parameters is the current one minus, you go in the opposite direction of the gradient. And you weight this uh, uh, move by a coefficient alpha, which is a hyperparameter, which is called the learning rate, and roughly speaking is the how fast you go in the direction of the uh, global minimum. If you have questions, we can, we can go, uh, come back to this uh, uh, later. Okay, and you repeat the process n times until converging toward the minimum solution. And if you want to practice a bit, this is the uh, this is the algorithm you can implement in uh, 10 minutes, okay, with Python, for example. You just take a training set. You want to learn a line. 
you initialize randomly your data and you repeat several times this, this operation. Okay, for the three parameters, theta zero, theta one, and theta two, you just apply the so-called gradient descent uh, uh, approach, right? And this is an illustration of how it works after one, two, five, ten, and one thousand iterations. And as you can see, after one thousand iteration, we converge toward the hyperplane, the coefficient theta zero, theta one, and theta two of the line, which perfectly, in this case, because it's a toy example and it's linearly separable, the line which perfectly discriminates. The two, the two categories. Okay. Okay. Uh, in the second part of this uh, of my talk, I would like to start by talking uh, by saying a few words about a key notion in machine learning, which is called the notion of overfitting. I already mentioned this uh, this notion by answering your question. So uh, basically, overfitting is a, a concept which comes from statistics, right? And it's uh, uh, an overfitting phenomenon happens when you use a, a model for learning which is excessively complex. And most of the time, we can express the notion of complexity, for example, intuitively by counting the number of uh, degrees of freedom of your uh, your model. If you learn a line in two D, you just have two parameters to learn. Uh, if you learn a hyperplane in a d-dimensional feature space, you have d plus one parameters. If you le learn a very high order polynomial in regression, you have many parameters, many degrees of freedom. And basically, uh, the complexity of a model depends on this number of degrees of freedom. The larger this number of degrees of freedom, the larger the risk of falling in uh, an overfitting phenomenon. So what is uh, an illustration of overfitting? You have an example here, right? Once again, binary classification, blue and red examples. And on the left, you have an underfitting phenomenon where actually the, 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 the expressiveness of the model is too simple. And in this case, as you can see on the left, probably your underlying problem, do you remember the underlying function f, which is unknown, is probably not something linear, right? And if you learn a line like here, you are making some errors at training time over your training examples, but probably you will suffer from a much higher error rate at test time when you will deploy this model. It's a too simple model. It's called underfitting. In the middle, you have an overfitting phenomenon. What is important to note here is that this model, which is a bit complicated, is perfect from the uh, empirical risk perspective. Because do you remember the empirical risk measure the, the level of disagreement between the classifier and the correct labels? And it turns out that this line is perfect because it doesn't make uh, this uh, piecewise uh, line <laughs> uh, um, is, all, is perfect because it doesn't make any error on the training set. But you can uh, 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 I guess that you, you you will agree with my claim. This uh, model is too complex, and if I deploy this model at test time, I will probably make a lot of errors on new examples because of the complexity of this model. And probably I don't know the the the, the actual sorry the actual uh, answer. But what is the best model in this toy, on this toy example? It's probably this one. Okay, is something which find a good trade-off between something too simple on the left, something too complex in the middle, right? It is worth noting that this function seems to provide a good generalization capacity. By generalization capacity, I mean its ability to correctly predict examples at test time, new examples. But on the other hand, what you can notice is that it makes it does make error on the training examples. And sometimes, this is what I'm going to explain in the, in, in the, um, in the following, you, you, you will prefer to make some errors on the training examples uh, if this allows you to learn a simpler model, right? So what, it's a key problem uh, we face in machine learning, the notion of overfitting. And I'm going to answer the question, how can we control the risk of overfitting when we learn 
a, a machine learning problem. Okay. I would like to say that this notion of good generalization from a theoretical perspective can be measures in, measured in some way by computing the deviation between the true risk, which is unknown, and the empirical risk, which is definitely computable. And this can be expressed in the form of theoretical bounds, generalization bounds. Uh, don't worry, I won't enter into too much uh, 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 into details of this of these bounds. Uh, but the main message uh, behind those bounds is the following. It's definitely possible in machine learning to measure the deviation between the true risk, which is once again unknown, you remember, because it depends on DZ, which is unknown. And this quantity, which is computable, because it's just the empirical loss over your training examples. And to the deviation between the two can be expressed in the form, okay, I won't enter into uh, specific details of this bound, they share the same shape here. The second term is a penalty term, which basically depends on two notions, the complexity of the model, okay, and the number of training examples. And as you can see, the complexity of the model appears at the numerator of the ratio, while the number of training examples appears at the denominator, which means that if you have a, a model, we, we, you are learning a very complex model, and the number of training examples is limited, the, the magnitude of this penalty term will be large. What does it mean? It means that even though your complex model allows you to perfectly learn your training examples. That was actually this example of overfitting. We learned by heart the examples. So in this case, the empirical risk is zero. This penalty term is used for taking into account the complexity of the model you used. And in this case, in my previous case, the complexity here is large. So you will pay the price by a large second term and even though you get something close to zero on the first term, the sum of the two gets something large, which tells, which will tell you that, unfortunately, the model you will use at this time will behave very poorly, even though it was perfect at test time. So, uh, most of you won't uh, derive generalization guarantees in machine learning, okay? But you just have to keep in mind that, and this is a part of our job, uh, the expert in machine learning, is to derive such bounds just to inform you that be very careful when you learn something too complex, even though it perfectly fits the data at training time, the behavior at test time will be very poor because of the complexity of the model. There is only one possibility to overcome the, a, too, uh, a too large complexity value. It's uh, to have a massive number of training examples. So this is a very important take home message. If you take a very complex model because you trust it, you want to learn something complicated to compensate the risk of overfitting, you need to collect much more example to allow this term to 10 to zero, right? So, the, do you remember my first take home message? Data is key in machine learning. And this is an illustration uh, with these generalization guarantees. Okay. Uh, so, this is exactly an illustration of what I said before. So, on this example, the true, the empirical risk is zero. On this example, underfitting, you are making six errors. And on the right, you are making two errors. And unfortunately, if your algorithm, if you, if you um, implement an algorithm which ends at minimizing the empirical loss, the number of errors worth speaking over your training examples, the risk is that in this example, you will select this model because if you compare the number of errors, this is this one the best, the best one. And you are going to learn a model which is actually uh, not, well, not well suited 
because it will uh, uh, it will make a lot of errors at test time. So we need a trick. We need a, a method for controlling this for controlling this risk of overfitting. And this is what I'm going to to show you in a in a few seconds. Just to show you here a regression problem, we are observing exactly the same phenomenon in regression. So we have blue points that have been randomly drawn according to the green line. I'm cheating. The green line is supposed to be unknown. And suppose that those blue examples have been with some noise randomly drawn according to the blue, to the green line. And on the left, we learn a line, which is totally stupid because we are not capturing the trend of the data. So the loss here is, is positive. Uh, here, we have an overfitting phenomenon because just by fitting a high order polynomial or of order nine, it's possible in red to perfectly fit the data. As you can see, the red line passes through all the training examples. But unfortunately, it's very different from the green line, which means that at test time, uh, uh, it will be catastrophic because the red line will make a lot of errors. But unfortunately, the loss is zero. So your machine learning algorithm will select this guy, right? So now I'm going to show you how to address this problem of the risk of overfitting. And one way to do this is to use a so-called regularization uh, parameter term. Okay, so I'm going to talk about this very key notion in machine learning, the notion of regularization and the notion of regularized risk minimization. So what we do in practice in machine learning, whatever the machine learning algorithm you will use in the future, we still want to minimize, sorry, you, you, we still want to minimize the empirical risk because it is, it is the only thing we can compute in practice because we, we have access to the data. But at the same time, we have an additional term, which is called the regularization parameter, okay? This regularization allows you to inject side information or some prior knowledge about your, the, your background. For example, if you have some background to solve a, a, a problem in physics, maybe you will be able to, to inject some information about the parameters you are looking for according to your knowledge in physics. You can also, by regularizing your model, to get to transform an ill-posed problem into a well-posed problem with the uniqueness and the existence of, an, of, a, of a solution. And most of the time, it will allow you to converge much faster and to have a very uh, efficient model to get the solution. So how it works, let's take an example. Uh, I will take an example in regression because I think that it's, uh, it's more meaningful. So let's suppose that I want to learn a polynomial of order m, right? So theta zero plus theta one x plus theta two x uh, x and so on and so forth. X two, x three, uh, and so on. X to the power of m. So it's a polynomial. Uh, we have only one feature in this toy example. Only one feature x. Okay. So what you want to learn is the feature vector theta zero, theta one, theta m. So the coordinates. Uh, of the polynomials. So you have a feature vector. So it means that now you can compute the norm, the LP norm of this vector. Okay, so what is, what is the LP norm? This is the general definition of a norm of a vector. I guess that everybody knows, most of you knows this, this definition. The LP norm of a vector is the pth root of the sum of the values to the power of p. Right, and you have uh, some uh, popular examples like uh, when p is two, you just have the the, the L two norm, so the, the the square root of the square values, which uh, which is related to the Euclidean distance. If p is, is one, you get the sum of the absolute values, so you get uh, something which is close to the Manhattan distance. Right. So, if you take, for example, the L two norm square, just to get rid of the square root. Right, the L2 norm of a vector is just the sum of the square values of this vector. And it turns out that if you plug this norm there, what is the direct impact of this minimization 
you are going to reduce the magnitude of the parameters. So by reducing the magnitude of the parameters theta 0, theta 1, theta m, you are going to simplify, to smooth the red curve you are learning just by controlling, rest, uh, constraining the, the, the magnitude of the individual parameters of the polynomial, right? So this L2 is very cool because just by plugging this uh, norm, which is, by the way, convex, oops, differentiable everywhere, uh, you can control the risk of overfitting because if the magnitude is large, which allows you to learn functions which are very complex, you can control the, this risk by increasing lambda, the regularization parameter, which control the influence of this norm in the, the objective function, in the, in the global optimization problem. So if lambda is zero, you retrieve the empirical risk and you are going to only focus, your main goal is to learn by heart your examples. And unfortunately, you will face uh, the risk of overfitting. If lambda is too large, you will, you, 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 won't, you won't care about the, the empirical risk. And the main goal will be, I want to learn something very simple. And the risk is to underfit the data. And what you have to do is to find a good compromise between overfitting and underfitting by carefully tuning this hyperparameter lambda. Okay? So lambda play, plays a key role, and we can tune efficiently this parameter. I will come back to this later, how to tune this, this parameter to get a good compromise between underfitting and overfitting. Okay. So, I already said that this term penalizes a large norm. We control the magnitude of the coefficients, and that's it. Now, I would like to, to explain uh, from a geometric perspective how the, the norm uh, 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 works in a machine learning problem. So, this is my new uh, uh, regularized optimization problem. Okay, it turns out that we can rewrite this problem into a constraint problem, this one. Uh, the meaning of this second problem is the following. We want to minimize the number of errors, the loss over the training examples. And at the same time, we want the norm of my parameters to be bounded by a quantity C. And geometrically speaking, it means that we want the norm to belong to, the, to a ball of radius, the value C, right? So the larger lambda, the larger lambda, the smaller the radius of the ball. You want to constrain a, a lot the magnitude of your parameters. And let's take an example. So with the L2 norm, here you have in green, you have a top view. You have a top view of, of, my, of my convex loss, loss function. It's a top view of this function, right, in, in green. It's a top view. And you have in blue the contour lines of this function, right? And obviously, we have, we have a convex function, and what you want is to find the minimum, uh, the global minimum of this convex function. It's the red point here. If you do not control the magnitude, the radius of the ball related to the norm of uh, your theta parameters, for example, if you set lambda equals zero, the radius of this blue sphere won't be constrained and you will be able to reach the global minimum, right? The price to pay is that you will need, you will have two parameters, theta one and theta two, with a large magnitude, you can have two very massive numbers, right? If you now, if you if you set lambda to something greater than zero, as I said before, if you increase lambda, you reduce you reduce 
the radius of the blue ball. And by reducing the blue ball, the optimal value in red you will be able to, to reach is this point. And it turns out that this point is not the global optimum anymore. But as I, as I explained before, sometimes we prefer to make some errors by allowing the, the classifier to misclassify some examples if it, this leads to a, a much simpler model. And this is exactly what happens here. You don't reach the global minimum anymore, but the nice news is that now the corresponding theta parameters of this solution sorry, are theta one and theta two. And as you can see, this value is smaller than this one. And this value is smaller than this one, which means that I reduce the magnitude of the coefficient of my, hyper, of my polynomial. So now I get something which is much smoother, reducing drastically the risk of overfitting. Okay, I hope you get the point because this parameter plays a key role in any actually machine learning algorithm. Okay, so what time is it? Yeah, so I have an illustration here just to empirically show you how it works. Let's suppose that we are in a regression problem, right? We have a set of points in blue. Uh, you remember this can be uh, can be the day, and this is the temperature we want to uh, predict, right? So we have a bunch of examples, and in this case, we want to learn the parameters of a line, right? So a line is theta zero plus theta one x, right? As I explained before, uh, one uh, loss function we can use is the least square. We just want to minimize the quadratic the, the Euclidean distance, let's say, between the point and the predicted value by the hyperplane over the entire training set. So it does, it, it's the sum of the square differences, right? So this is our goal. What I'm going to do is to take the loss. This is nothing more than the square loss. And I will add a regularization uh, term in the form of the L2 norm. So the square of the L2 norm, just once again, to get rid of the square root. So in this case, it's just theta zero squared, theta one squared, right? And now this function, it turns out that this function is, is convex. It's strongly convex because of the square here, because of the L2 norm, which is square. So I can very efficiently uh, uh, compute the derivative uh, of this function with respect to theta zero and theta one and set it to zero. And I get, I don't enter into details, I get this expression. I do the same for theta one, and I get this expression. And what is very nice is that you can see the analytical expression of the optimal solution, and you can see that lambda appears at the denominator of both terms, which means that if you increase lambda, you decrease, you are decreasing the magnitude, sorry, the magnitude of the parameters. So this is on a very toy, uh, toy example uh, for a line, but it works the same, the same for high order polynomials. If you take a polynomial of, the, of order 14, let's say, with the same algorithm, exactly the same, by using an L2 norm, if lambda is zero, uh, is, is, is uh, sorry, is set to infinity, I remind you that if lambda is large, you only focus on, if lambda is large, you are only interested in this term because you want to minimize the sum of the two. You, you don't care about this one. So you get something which is totally stupid, but, but which is very simple. It's underfitting. Here, it's when lambda is very close to zero. Since it's very close to zero, you don't care about the complexity of the model and you only focus on uh, the first term and you will overfit the data. And this is the examples here. This model is very bad because it, it will behave very poorly at test time. And a good compromise, if you tune well your parameter lambda, you will get something much smoother, which is probably, I don't know the real answer, but probably this will have a very good generalization capacity at test time. I remind you that I use exactly the same 
complexity of the model for the three illustrations I just played here with the lambda to control the risk of overfitting of the data. Just a few words about the L1 norm. I told you that we can use any LP norm. Oh, by the way, not any LP norm because uh, under one, if you take a L0.5 norm, uh, you, you get something which is not not um, not convex, right? So, so I suggest to use something with at least a L1 norm. You can use the L2 norm and so on and so forth, the infinity norm. When you use the L1 norm, you have more or less the same ID. You control the magnitude of the parameters, so it's pretty cool. It behaves similarly as the L2 norm, but you have an additional pro for the L1 norm. It guides many coefficients of the model will 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 be driven to to zero, right? So you have an illustration here. Graphically, I won't enter into the mathematical uh, details because it's a bit more complicated. But you remember, this is my convex function, my empirical risk here. This is my empirical risk, a top view with the contour lines. My optimum is there. If you use the L1 norm, you don't have a, a, a ball anymore. You have a, like a diamond. And what is very interesting is that with the L1 norm, with a high probability, the intersection between the blue curve and the diamond will happen, as you can see on this slide, at the corner of the diamond. And what does it mean? It means that theta 1 is 0. You don't need theta 1 anymore. The message is that, in this case, the L1 norm allows us to induce so-called sparse models, a parsimonic model, right? And you have an illustration on the same example as before, with a polynomial of order 14. When you set lambda to a very small value, you control the magnitude, so you get more or less the same effect as the uh, that of the L2 norm, but at the same time, Two parameters among theta 0, theta 1, theta 14 are set to zero. So you don't need them anymore. If you increase a bit lambda, you have this function, which is very, very similar to this one. But now you have six zeros. And if you set lambda to a large, larger value, you get now 11 zeros. As you can see, the shape of the, of the function is changing, is slightly changing. I, I don't know if it's the perfect one here because you are losing a bit. Sorry, you are losing a bit uh, this this trend, but it's still okay. It's still okay, and you save eleven parameters among fourteen. And what is the impact of this in practice? In practice, if you have a sparse model, you can save time. You can save time, money, money, and you also get interpretable models. If you take this example, and let's suppose that I have a, a medical application. I want to determine if a patient is affected by the coronavirus, okay? Thanks to the expertise of, of, the, of the doctors, I know that some features are very important. The loss of smell or taste, uh, the cough. Uh, if uh, the patient has a headache or not, uh, the temperature of the, of the patient, and maybe some information we can get from an MRI scan, right? Let's suppose that we take a training set, we learn a model, this one, for the sake of simplicity, I'm just learning a hyperplane, something linear, and I learn with a standard machine learning algorithm the parameters theta 0, theta 1, theta 2. But what I'm, what I'm going to do is to use a norm, a L1, sorry, a, a, a L1 norm over the parameters as additional term of my, of my empirical risk. Okay? What happens if one parameter is set to zero? Let's suppose that theta 5 is driven to zero thanks to the L1 norm. It turns out that in this case, if theta 5 is zero, you don't need any more X5, right? And since we don't know, we don't need X5 anymore, you don't need to have an MRI. 
right? Because the model tells you that according to my training data, it suffices to have X1, X2, X3, X4 to determine if a patient is affected by coronavirus. Just by using this simple trick, this simple toy, uh, uh, simple tool, you will be able to save money and time by removing this, this uh, feature, which is supposed to be relevant for the, for the task at hand. Okay, I've got the time. Perfect. Uh, I will finish this lecture by um, giving you some um, a good practice for spitting your training examples. Okay, for learning the model, for tuning the hyperparameters, and for estimating the quality of the model. So you already know this slide. I show you it during the introduction. I I explained that there are some popular learning uh, methods, deep learning, SVMs, and nearest neighbors, decision trees, or regression. And I explained that for each of them, we have to learn parameters, the, the famous theta parameters. The theta parameters in a deep learning, as I said, corresponds to the weights of the networks. So here you have theta zero, theta one, theta n, and so on and so forth. So you have plenty of parameters to learn with a deep neural network. It turns out that in deep learning, we have also hyperparameters. What is the difference between the parameters and the hyperparameters? The parameters are the, the, uh, the degrees of freedom of your model, the parameters which describe the model, while the hyperparameters, for example, in deep learning are the number of hidden layers of your deep network. So it corresponds to parameters of your, the architecture of your model. It's not the parameters you are going to learn. It's the hyperparameter describing the characteristic of your architecture. The number of iterations you will run uh, 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 when learning. The number of batch size for those who are familiar with deep learning, the learning rate alpha, do you remember? And obviously, the lambda parameter. The, the parameter, the regularization parameter. All those guys are called hyperparameters. I hope that you, you, you see the difference between those hyperparameters and the parameters of the model, right? Which are the, the weights of the neural network. In super vector machines, we have to choose as hyperparameter the kernel or the regularization parameter C. In KNN, do you remember? I explained that. Uh, According to the to the saying, birds of a feather flock together. We assign the the majority label in the close neighborhood of a, of an example, k, which which is the, the the size of the neighborhood, is once again a hyperparameter, and there is also the notion of metric, which is the the, the function you are going to use to, to to know if you are neighbor or not. In decision tree, we have the split measure the depth of the of the of the tree and so on and so forth and obviously in regression you have the degree of the polynomial so the degree of the polynomial is a hyperparameter while the coefficients of the polynomial are the parameters to learn i hope that with those examples you you you, you make the difference now between parameters and hyperparameters it turns out that we cannot optimize theta the parameters and the hyperparameters like lambda on the same examples. Because if you do so, you will have a too optimistic model. And when you will deploy the model at test time, you will probably be very disappointed. So that's why we need to split the data into two parts, one for learning the parameters and one for learning optimizing the hyperparameters. And this is what I want to what I, what I show you on this slide, usually the good practice in machine learning is the following. You have a data set, your famous data set S composed of uh, M, sorry, M examples. What you do in practice, you split this data set into three parts, the training part, the validation part, and the test part. The test part, is used at the end of the day for estimating the quality of your model at test time, right? On new or non-examples. That's why you need, we need to 
to keep apart some examples that haven't been used so far, just because we don't want to cheat, we need new examples to evaluate the model. And the remaining examples usually are splitting into two parts. One called training for training the parameters of your model or to train different machine learning, learning algorithm. Oh, by the way, the choice of a machine learning algorithm can be considered as a hyperparameter. You test SVMs, deep learning, Kenny rest neighbors, decision tree, and what you want is to select the best one. This choice is nothing more than a hyperparameter, right? And you can also train one machine learning algorithm with different hyperparameters, like uh, you change the architecture of your deep neural networks, you plug additional hidden layers, you add new neurons, and so on and so forth, right? So you use this training part for learning the model. Once it's done, you want to select the best hyperparameters, and this is done on the validation set. For example, if you train several regression models with several polynomials of order one, two, three, four, five, and among the five you want to select the best, this selection will be performed over the validation set. And this is very important because you are using examples that haven't been used so far for learning, right? So you get an unbiased, an unbiased estimate of your hyperparameters. And once it's done, once you have selected the best machine learning algorithm, the best hyperparameters, you can now use your test examples to evaluate at test time the capacity of your model to, 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 uh, to perform uh, well at, at, new, uh, at test time. Just for your information, if you have a lot of examples, what you can do is to repeat this split train and validation several times. And this is the, the idea of the K cross validation procedure. You do exactly the same as before, but in this case, you split your data, your remaining data in K folds, right? You keep K minus one for learning and the K remaining subset for uh, uh, validating, for tuning your, your hyperparameters. You do it once and then you repeat K times the same process by uh, uh, running the same process over the, the, the K possible combinations of K minus one subsets among the K, right? So at, the, at time two, you will keep this one as the validation one, and you take the, the, the K minus two first plus the K one. You learn with those guys and you validate on the K minus one, and you repeat it for the K combinations uh, of subsets, right? To finish my lecture, I would like to give you um, an illustration of how to uh, how to make use of the the error rate you are observing at training time and test time to uh, address uh, the trade-off between a good empirical risk and a large complexity or a small complexity, right? So I explained uh, before that we, we also have a, a, um, a compromise between learning something very complex for getting a, an almost perfect model at training time, but the risk of overfitting is large, or getting something very simple, but the price to pay is that probably the empirical risk will be large. Basically, roughly speaking, this first term, the empirical risk, is, is, is often called the bias of your model. And the second penalty term is often called the variance. And there is a trade-off between the bias and the variance. If you, take a, if you learn a line, the variance is small because the, its complexity is small. But unfortunately, most of the problems are not linearly separable, and though the, in this case, the bias will be large, while the variance is small. And on the other hand, if you take something very, very complicated, probably the, the bias will be close to zero because you, 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 you are able to perfectly learn your training examples. But the price to pay is that you will have a, a, a huge complexity and the variance will be large, right? It turns out that just by observing the accuracy of your model or the error rate of your model, at training and validation time, you can change your model efficiently. 
let's suppose, and I will finish with this example, let's suppose that I want to address the problem of recognition of cats from images, right? And I know that this problem is can be uh, perfectly achieved by, uh, by a human being, right? So it means that, by the way, I didn't introduce this, no this notion, but it means that the bias error is close to zero. It means that the problem is learnable almost perfectly. If you use a machine learning algorithm and you observe that at training time, you get an error close to zero, one person. And then you apply the model on the validation set and you get a much larger error rate, like 11%. What, what kind of conclusion you can make? Since this quantity is very close to the expected one, it means that probably the expressiveness of your model is, uh, 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 is sufficient. So you don't know, you don't need to complexify more your model because you could learn your data, right? But it seems that when you deploy your model on new data on the validation set, you make you are making much more errors, which means that this is exactly the illustration of overfitting. Since you are overfitting, you remember that one way to prevent an overfitting phenomenon is to increase m at the denominator of this ratio. So if it's possible, according to your application at hand, you need to collect much more examples to get a, a good model without changing the, for example, the, the architecture of your deep neural network, because it's the expressiveness seems to be okay for addressing this problem. And to show you a counter example, if on the same application, you use a machine learning algorithm and you have an error close to 15%, which is very far from zero. This is an illustration of underfitting, which means that probably the expressiveness, the complexity of your model is not sufficiently large to address the problem, right? And you observe that on the validation set, the difference is very small. So it, it means that you didn't overfit, but you need to complexify a bit the complexity, the, the, the expressiveness of your model to address the problem. So in this case, I would suggest, for example, in deep learning, to add additional hidden layers, neurons, to complexify a bit the expressivity of your model to be able to, to, to reach the, the target concept. I hope that with these two examples, you have a very practical uh, 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 advice to, for, for modifying uh, uh, the architecture, the, uh, the, the parameters of your model to address uh, the, the task, the task at hand.